Havlin towns in Brunswick, my famous Hanover city. The river Wesser, deep and wide, washes its wall on the southern side. A pleasanter spot you've never spied. But when begins my ditty, almost 500 years ago, to see the townsfolk suffer so from vermin was pity. Rats, they fought the dogs and killed the cats, and bit the babies in the cradles, and ate the cheeses from the vats, and licked the soup from the cook's own ladles. Split open the kegs of salted sprats, they nest in the men's Sunday hats, and even spoiled the women's chats by drowning out their speaking with shrieking and squeaking in fifty different sharps and flats. At last the people in a body to the town hall came flocking. Tis clear, cried they, our mayor is a naughty, and as for our corporation, shocking, think we buy gowns lined with vermin, for dolts who can't or won't determine. What's best to rid us up our vermin? You hope because you're old and obese to find the furry cinder groves ease. Rouse up, sirs, give your brains a racking to find the remedy we are lacking, for sure as fate will send you packing. At this the Baron Corporation quaked with a mighty consternation. An hour they sat in council, at length the mayor broke silence. For a gilder eyed my ermine gown cell. I wish I were a mile hence. It's easy to bid one rack one's brain. I'm sure my poor head aches again. I scratch it so, but all in vain. Oh, for a trap, a trap, a trap. Just as he said this, what should hap? At the chamber door, but a gentle tap. Bless us, cried the mayor, what's that? With the corporation as he sat, looking little through wonder as fat. Nor brighter were his eyes, or moister, than a too long opened oyster, save when at noon his paunch grew mutinous, for a plate of turtle green and glutinous. Only a scraping of shoes on a mat, anything like the sound of a rat makes my heart go pit a pat. Come in, cried the mare, looking bigger, and in did come the strangest figure. His long queer coat from heel to head was half yellow and half red. And he himself is tall and thin, with sharp blue eyes, each like a pin, the light loose hair and swarthy skin, nor tuft of hair on cheek, nor beard on chin. But lips or smile went out and in, there was no guessing his kith or kin, and nobody could enough admire this tall man in his quaint attire. Quoth one, it's as my great grandsire, starting up at the trump of doom's tone, had walked this way from his painted tombstone. He advanced towards the council table, and please, your honor, said he, I am able. 
by means of secret charm to draw all the creatures living beneath the sun. They crawl or swim or fly or run after me, so as you never saw. And I chiefly use my charm on creatures that do people harm, the mole and toad and newt and viper. People call me the Pied Piper. And here they notice round his neck a scarf of red and yellow stripe to match with his coat of self-same check. And that scarf stands on the pipe, and his fingers they notice were never straying, as if impatient to be playing upon this pipe, as low as dangled over his vesture soul spangled. Yes, said he, Pied Piper as I am, in Tartari I bred the cam, last June from his huge swarm of gnats. I ease in Asia and I am a monstrous brood of vampire bats. And as for what your brain bewilders, if I rid your town of rats, will you give me one thousand guilders? One, fifty thousand was the exclamation of astonished bear corporation. Into the street the piper steps, smiling first a little smile, as if he knew what magic stuff in his quiet pipe the while. Like a musical adept, like a musical adept, blow his pipe his lips and wrinkled, and green and blue his sharp eyes twinkled, like a candle flame where salt is sprinkled, and ere three shrill notes the pipe utter, he heard as if an army mutter, and a muttering grew to a grumbling, and a grumbling grew to a mighty grumbling, and out of the houses came the rats tumbling. Great rats, small rats, lean rats, brawny rats, brown rats, black rats, gray rats, tawny rats, grave old plotters, gay young friskers, fathers, mothers, uncles, cousins, cocking tails and pricking whiskers, families by tens and dozens, brothers, sisters, husbands, wives, follow the pipe, pipe before their lives. Sweet street and pipe advancing, step for step they follow dancing, until they came to the river Wesser. Wherein all plunged and perished, save one who stumped as Julius Caesar, swam across and lived to carry, as he, a man, as he the manuscript he cherished, to rat land home his commentary, which was, after his shrill notes of the pipe, I heard a sound as a scraping tripe, and putting apples wondrous ripe into the cider press's gripe, and moving away a pickle tub boards, and leaving a jar of conserve cupboards, and drawing the corks of train oil flasks, breaking lips of butter casks. It seemed as if a voice, sweeter far than by harp and by solaries breathe, called out, oh, rats, rejoice. The world is grown to a vast dry saltery. So munch on, crunch on, take your nunch on, breakfast, supper, dinner, lunch on, and just a bulky sugar punch on, already stayed like a great sun shone. Gracious scarce an inch before me, just as me thought it said, come bore me, I found the western rolling over me. You should have heard the Hamlin people ring the bells they rocked the steeple. Go, cried the mayor, get long poles, poke up the nest and block up the holes. Consult with carpenters and builders, leave in our town not even a trace of the rats. When suddenly up the face of the piper perked in the marketplace, the first, if you please, my thousand guilders. A thousand guilders. The mayor looked blue, so did the corporation too, for council did made where havoc was claret will sell in the grob hawk, and half the money would have punish their seller's biggest blood of Rhenish, to pay this sum to a wondering fellow, a gypsy coat of red and yellow. Besides, quoth the mayor with a knowing wink, our business was done at the river's brink. We saw with our eyes the vermin sink, what's dead can't come to life, I think. So, friend, we're not folks to shrink from our duty of giving you something to drink. <coughs> no matter of money put in your poke, but as for gilders, what we spoke of them, as you well know, was a joke. Besides, our losses have made us thrifty. A thousand gilders, come, take fifty. The piper's face fell and he cried. No trifling, I can't wait beside. I promise a visit by dinner time, Baghdad. And except the prime the head cook's potage. All he's rich in, having left in the caliph's kitchen of a nest of scorpions, no survivor. With him I proved no bargain driver. With you don't think I'll bait a stiver. The folks who put me in a passion may find me pipe after another fashion. How, cried the mayor, you think I broke, being worse treated than a cook, insulted by a rival, with the idle pipe and vesture piebald. Threaten us, fellow, do your worst, pull your pipe here till you burst. <laughs> 
Once more he stepped into the street, and to his lips again laid his long pipe and smooth straight cane. And there he blew three notes, such sweet, soft notes as yet musicians cutting their gave the enraptured air. There was a rust and it seemed like a bustling, and merry crowds adjusting, a pitching, a hustling. Small feet were pattering, wood shoes clattering, little hands clapping, little tongues chattering, like foals in the farm river, barley is scattering. Out came the children running, all the little boys and girls, with rosy cheeks and flax and curls, and sparkling eyes and teeth like pearls, tripping and skipping around merrily after, the wonderful music was shouting and laughter. The mayor was dumb when the countess stood, as if they're changed in the blocks of wood, unable to move a step or cry, to the children merrily skipping by. Could only follow with an eye the joyous crowd at the piper's back. And how the mare was on the rack, and the wretched council's bosoms beat <coughs> as the piper turned from the high street to where the west had rolled its waters right in the way of their sons and daughters. <laughs> Excuse me, oh my god. The council stood as if they're changed in the blocks of wood, unable to move a step or cry to the children merrily skipping by. Could only follow with an eye that joyous crowd of pikers back. How the mare was on the rack, and the wretched council's bosom beat as the piper turned from the high street, where the western rolled its waters right in the way of their sons and daughters. Our returned from south to west, and to climb where Gail is stuck to dress, and after him the children pressed. Great was the joy in every breast. He never crossed the mighty top. His voice let the piping drop. We shall see our children stop. When lo, they reached the mountainside, a wondrous portal opened wide, as if a cavern was suddenly hollowed. The piper advanced, and the children followed. And when all were into the very last, the door in the mountainside shut fast. Did I say all? Oh, no one was lame, and could not dance the whole of the way. And then after years, if you blame his sadness, he was used to say, as dull in our town since my playmates left, I can't forget that I'm bereft of all the pleasant sights they see, which the piper also promised me. For he led us, he said, to a joyous land, joining the town with just a hand, where waters gushed and fruit trees grew, and flowers were formed a fair of you, and everything was strange in you. The square was bright of peacock here, their dogs and ran our fellow deer, and honeybees had lost their stings. The horses were born with eagles' wings, and just as I became assured, my lady for me speedy cured. The music stopped, and I stood still, and found myself outside the hill, left behind against my will, go now lifting as before, and never hear of thy country more. Alas, alas, for Hamelin, who came into many a murderous fate, a text which says in heaven's gate, oak is the rich at its easy rate, as an eagle's eye takes a Hamelin. The mayor sent east, west, north, and south, to offer the piper by word of mouth, Wherever was men's lot to find him, silver and gold to his heart's content, if only he were turned away his way and bring the children behind him. <coughs> but when they saw it was lost endeavor, the piper and dancers were gone forever. They made a decree that lawyers never should think their records dated duly, if after the day of the month and year, these words do not as well appear. And so long after what happened here, on the 22nd of July, 1376, and the better in memory to fix the place of children's last retreat. They called it the Pied Piper Street, where anyone played pipe or taper was sure for his future to lose his labor, nor suffered they hostel or tavern, chalk with mirth a street so solemn. And opposite the place of the cavern, they wrote a story on a column, and on great church window painted the same to make the world acquainted how their children were stolen away, and there it stands this very day. And I must not admit to say, in Transylvania there is a tribe of alien people who ascribe the way and dress of which their neighbors lay such stress to their fathers and mothers having risen out of some subterranean prison and to which they were Japan a long time ago in a mighty band out of Hamlin town to Brunswick land but how or why they don't understand. So Lily, let me and you be wipers of scores out with old men, especially pipers 
if they should pipe us free from rats or mice, if we promise them not, let us keep our promise.
There was once a young man named Roland Pye who played the recorder when he wasn't baking bagels. One day he was walking through a park and playing his recorder to rest a while from all his baking when suddenly he spied a corpse lying on the ground beneath a swarm of flies. He put down his recorder, walked over to the corpse, shooed the flies away, and covered the dead man with stones. Returning to his oven later that day, he found that his oven blade had gone on by itself and already baked half the bagels he needed. From that day on, Roland Pied was the happiest baker alive. He would bake until he was tired, then he would pull his recorder out of his pocket while his oven blade went on by itself. But Roland Pied lived in a town whose mayor did not admire his skill and was jealous of his fame. So the mayor devised a plan to rid the town of Roland. In the beginning, he said that Roland baked a whole lot, but badly. Then he said that Roland was a good baker, baked a whole lot, but badly. Then he said that Roland was a sorcerer, and the people turned on him. Therefore, Roland Pye took his recorder and left his home behind. When Roland Pye came to a neighboring town, he went to all the business owners but none of them would give him any work. Finally, he met an old busker and asked him for work to keep body and mind together. Come along with me, said the old man, and we will share arms together. So Roland Pied and the old man started going around and singing. Baker, why do you bear those silent things? Baker, how did you forget to stand where your feet are? Baker, no woman loves your wealth. Although it is gold and good for her health. Baker, you are too dirty for a lover to wish to preach. Your limbs are the knots and cords of an old fashioned machine. Baker, line the rings and bash the boards. You don't need their applause for a thing that is yours. You are a baker and are what you are, not by a miracle, but by the work of your arms. Baker, be who you are. Everybody gave alms to the old man, but to Roland they said, What is a young man like you out begging? Why don't you work for a living? Nobody will hire me, replied Roland Pye. That's what you say. There is a king with so many hungry soldiers that he'll pay good wages anyone willing to feed them. So Roland Pye went to the king's kitchen and took the old man whose alms he'd been sharing come along with the oven had never been used by anyone. Roland mixed the dough, then he rolled it into rings, then he boiled them, dressed them with seeds, and baked them until they were golden brown. Then he tossed them into a crate to cool down. Whenever Roland wearied of baking, he would play his recorder, and once he was weary of playing his recorder, he would sing. Baker, why do you bear those silent things? Baker, how do you forget to stand where your feet are? Baker, no woman loves your wealth, although it is golden and good for her health. Baker, you are too dirty for a lover to wish to preen. Your limbs are the knots and cords of an old-fashioned machine. Baker, line the rings and bash the boards. You don't need their applause for a thing that is yours. You are a baker and are what you are not by a miracle, but by the work of your arms. Baker, be who you are. Hearing the singing, a princess looked out the window. She saw Roland Pye and fell in love with him. But she was a princess, and he a baker. The king would never consent to their marriage. So they decided to run away together. They fled at night to the boat. When they were already on the high seas, Roland Pied remembered the bus busker. He said to his beloved, We must fetch the old man, since he shared his arms with me. We can't go off and leave him like that. At that very moment, the old man came up behind the boat, walking on the water as though it had been dry land. Reaching the boat, he said, we agreed to divide everything we had, and I shared everything I own. Now you have the king's daughter, 
must give half of her to me. At this he gave Roland Pied a knife to cut his bride in half. Roland Pied took the knife with a trembling hand. You are right, he said. You are perfectly right. He was on the point of cutting his bride in two, when suddenly the old man stopped him. Stop. Well, I knew you were a just man. I am the dead man, mind you, whom you covered with stones. Go now, and may the two of you always be happy. The old man walked away on the waves. The boat came to an island rich in all good things, with a princely palace awaiting the newlyweds. My first thought was he lied in every word, that hoary cripple with malicious eye, askance to watch the working of his lie on mine, and most scarce able to afford, suppression of the glee that person scored its edge at one more victim gained thereby. What else should he be set for with his staff? What save the waylay with his lies and snare, all travelers who might find him posted there, and ask the road, I guessed what skull like laugh would break, what crutch can write my epitaph for pastime in the dusty thoroughfare. If at his counsel I should turn aside into ominous track which all agree hides the dark tower, yet acquiescingly at a turn as he pointed, neither pride nor hope for kindling at the end described, so much as glad as some end might be. For what with my whole world wide wondering, what with my search drawn out through years, my hope dwindled into a ghost not fit to cope with that obstreperous joy success would bring. Hardly tried now to rebuke the spring my heart made, finding failure in its scope. As the sick man, very near to death, seems dead indeed, and feels the beginning and the tears, and takes a farewell of each friend, and hears one bid the other go, draw breath freely outside, since all is over, he saith, and the blow fallen, no grieving can amend. While some discuss if near other graves be room enough for this, but when a day suits best for carrying the corpse away, with careful banners, scarfs, and staves, and still the man hears all, and only craves, he may not shape such tender love and stay. Thus I had for so long suffered on in this quest. Thus I had for so long suffered in this quest, heard failure and prophesied so often with, so many times among the band of wit, the knights who to our tower search addressed their step, but just to fail as they seem best, and all doubt was now should I be fit. So quiet as his fairy turned from him, that hateful cripple out of his highway into the path he pointed, all the day being a dreary one at best, and dim was settling into its clothes, yet shot one grim red deer to see the plain catch its stray. For Mark, no sooner was I fairly found, pledged the plain after a pace or two, and pausing through a back with the last view, over the safe road t'was gone, grave plain all around, nothing but plain to the horizon's bound, I must go on, naught else for me to do. So on I went, I think I never saw such dark and noble nature, nothing grows, no flowers as well as the cedar grown. But tortle and spurge according to their law, I propagate their kind with none to awe. You think a bird would be a treasure trove. No penry inertness in grimace, in some strange sort were the land's portion. See or close your eyes, said nature peevishly, and nothing skills, I can't help my case. Tis last Christmas fire must cure this place. Calcine must cause and set my prisoners free. If they're pushed in the ragged this stalk above its gates, its head was chopped, the beds were jealous else, 
who made the holes to rent in the dark, harsh horse leaves, bruised to walk all hope of greenness, tis a fruit must walk, passing their life on fruits and tents. As for the grass, it grew as scarce as hair and leprosy, thin dry blades pricked the mud, which underneath was beaten up with blood. One stiff and blind horse, his every bow missed air, stood stupefied however he came there, thrust out past service of the devil's stud. Alive, he might be dead for aught I know, with red dogs and calip neck astray, and shut eyes beneath the rusty mane, and seldom went such grotesqueness with such woe. I never saw a brute I hated so. He must have been wicked to deserve such pain. I shut my eyes and turned them on my heart, as a man calls for wine before he fights. I asked one draft of earlier, happier sights. Here fitly I could hope to play the part. Think first, fight afterwards, a soldier's art. One taste of old times, it's all to rights. Not it, I fancied Cuthbert's reddening face beneath its garniture of curly gold. Dear fellow, till I almost felt him fold. An arm in mine to fix me to that place. That way he used. Alas, one night's disgrace. I let my heart be fire and left it cold. Giles, then, the soul of honor, there he stands, frank as ten years ago, a night at first, an honest man should dare, he said he durst, good, but the scene shifts, fall when hangman's hand pinned to his breast of parchment, his own band reads it, poor traitor spit upon and cursed. Better that present than pass like that, back therefore to my darkening path, no sound of sight as far as the eye can strain, will the night send a howler or a badass? But something on the dismal flat came to arrest my thoughts and change their train. A sudden little river crossed my path, as unexpected as a serpent came. No tides congenial through the glooms. This is the froth by might have been a bath of the fiends blowing room. See the wrath of his black eddies be spat with plates and spoons. So petty yet so spiteful, all along low scrubby alders kneeled over it. Drenched willows flung them headlong, the fit broke despair. A suicidal throng, the river which had done them all the wrong, whatever that was, rolled by and turned no wit. Which while I forded, good saints, how I feared to set my foot upon a dead man's cheek. Each step revealed the spear I thrust to seek, while it was tangled his hair or beard. It may have been a water rat I speared, but ugh, it sounded like a baby shriek. Glad was I to reach the other bank, now for a better country, vain presage. Who are the strugglers? What war did they wage? Whose savage trample could thus pad the dank soil to a plash? Toads in a poison tank, wild cats in a red hawk cage. The fight must so have seemed in that foul cirque. What pet them there with all the plain to choose? No footsteps leading to that horrid muse. None out of it. Mad Bruin set to work their brains, no dull, the galley slaves of Turk pits for his pastime, Christians against Jews. And more than that, a furlong on, why there? What bad use was that engine for? That wheel, or break, not wheel. That hero fit to reel men's bodies out like silk. With all the air of Toph's tool, on earth left unaware, or brought to sharpen its rusty teeth of steel. Then came some stub ground, once a wood, next to marsh it would seem, now mere earth, desperate and done with, so the fool finds mirth. Makes a thing in marble till his mood changes. <coughs> and off he goes. Within a rude bog lay a marsh, sand and stark black dirt. Now blotches rankling color gay and grim. Now patches where some leanness of the soil broke into moss or substances like boils. Then came a palsy rope, a cleft in him, a distorted mouth that splits its rim. Gaping at death and dies while recoils. As far as ever from the end, not in the distance, but leaving not, to point my footsteps further at the thought, great black bird, Apollyon's bosom friend, sailed past the reed's wide wings dragon pen, that brushed my cap, perchance the guide I sought. For looking up where I somehow grew, the plain had given place all round the mountains with such names and grace, mere heights and heaps now stolen from you. How this they surprised me, saw but you. How to get from there was no clear case. Yet half I seem to recognize some trick of mischief had happened to me, God knows when, in a bad dream perhaps. Here ended then progress this way, when in the very nick of giving up one more time, came a click as when the trap ships are in the den. 
Burningly it came upon me all at once. This was the place. Those two hills crouched like two bulls while torn and torn in fight. While to the left a tall scalp mountain. Dunn's daughter been dozing at the very nuns after a lifetime of training for the sight. One in the midst lay with the tower itself, the round squat turret built of brown stone without a counterpart in the whole world. The tempest mocking owl points the ship and thus the unseen shell he strikes on only when timbers start. Not see, because of night perhaps, why day came back to that. Behind it left the dying sunset, kindled to a pet. The hills like two hot giants in the hunting lay, chin upon hand to see the game at bay, no stab and end the creature to the head. Not here, when noise was everywhere, I told, increasing like a bell, names in my ears, of lost adventurers, my tears, how such was strong and such was bold, and such was fortunate, yet each of old. Lost, lost, one moment now for golden years. There they stood, ranged along the hillside met, to view the last of me, a living frame, for one more picture in a sheet of flame. I saw them and knew them all, and yet, dauntless, a slugboard to my lips I sent to blue, child rolled into a dark tower came.
There was once a young man named Roland Pye who played the recorder when he wasn't baking bagels. One day he was walking through a park and playing his recorder to rest a while from all his baking when suddenly he spied a corpse lying on the ground beneath a swarm of flies. He put down his recorder, walked over to the corpse, shooed the flies away, and covered the dead man with stones. Returning to his oven later that day, he found that his oven blade had gone on by itself and already baked half the bagels he needed. From that day on, Roland Pied was the happiest baker alive. He would bake until he was tired, then he'd pull his recorder out of his pocket while his oven blade went on by itself. But Roland Pied lived in a town whose mayor did not admire his skill and was jealous of his fame. So the mayor devised plan to rid the town of Roland. In the beginning he said that Roland was a good worker, but baked a whole was a good worker but lazy. Then he said that Roland baked a whole lot, but badly. Then he accused Roland of being a sorcerer, and the people turned on him. Therefore Roland Pied took his recorder and left his home behind. When Roland Pied came to a neighboring town, he went to all the business owners but none of them would give him any work. Finally, he met an old busker and asked him for work to keep body and mind together. Come along with me, said the old man, and we will share alms. So Roland Pye and the old man started going around and singing. Baker, why do you bear those silent things? Baker, how did you forget to stand where your feet are? Baker, no woman loves your wealth, although it is golden and good for her health. Baker, you are too dirty for a lover to wish to preen. Your limbs are the knots and cords of the old-fashioned machine. Baker, line the rings and bash the boards. You don't need their flaws for a thing that is yours. You are a baker and are what you are, not by a miracle, but by the work of your arms. Baker, be who you are. Everybody gave alms to the old man, but to Roland they said, What is a young man like you out begging? Why don't you work for a living? Nobody will hire me, replied Roland Pye. That's what you say. There is a king with so many hungry soldiers that he'll pay good wages to anyone willing to feed them. So Roland Pye went to the king's kitchen and took the old man whose alms had been sharing. The oven had never been used by anyone. Roland mixed the dough then he rolled it into rings. Then he boiled them, dressed them with seeds, and baked them until they're golden brown. Then he tossed them into a crate to cool down. Whenever Roland wearied of baking, he'd play his recorder. And once he's weary of playing his recorder, he would sing. Baker, why do you bear those silent things? Baker, how did you forget to stand where your feet are? Baker, no woman loves your wealth. Although it is golden and good for her health, Baker, you are too dirty for a lover to wish to preen. Your limbs are the knots and cords of an old-fashioned machine. Baker, line the rings and bash the boards. You don't need their applause for a thing that is yours. You are a baker and are what you are, not by a miracle, but by the work of your arms. Baker, be who you are. Hearing the singing, the princess looked out the window. She saw Roland Pye and fell in love with him. But she was a princess and he a baker. The king would never consent to their marriage. So they decided to run away together. They fled at night in a boat. When they were already on the high seas, Roland remembered the buster. He said to his beloved, We must fetch the old man. Since he shared his own with me, we can't go off and leave him like that. At this, at that, at that very moment, the old man came up behind the boat, walking on the water as though it had been dry land. Reaching the boat, he said, We agreed to divide everything we had, and I shared everything I owned. Now you have the king's daughter. You must give half of her to me. At this he gave Roland Pye the knife to cut his bride in two. 
Warm pie, I did, uh, Warm pie took the knife with a trembling hand. You are right, he said. You are perfectly right. He was on the point of cutting his bride in two when suddenly the old man stopped him. Stop! I knew you were a just man. I am the dead man, mind you, whom you covered with stones. Go now, and may the two of you always be happy. <clears throat> the old man walked away on the waves. The boat came to an island rich in all good things with a princely palace awaiting the newlyweds. There was once a rich man who had just one son, and the boy was dearly loved by his father. As everybody knows, the greatest scourge on earth for a rich man is work. Therefore, when, the, when his son turned fourteen, his father decided to send him to school to learn the science of laziness. On the same street as the rich man there lived a famous and highly respected professor who had never done a lick of work in his life he could get out of doing. The rich man called on him and found him stretched out in the garden beneath the big tree with a cushion under his head, a cushion under his back, and a cushion under his buttocks. Before talking to him, I must first see how he does, said the rich man to himself. And he hid behind he hid behind a hedge to observe the man. To observe the man. The professor lay as still as a corpse, with his eyes closed. mouth and put it, bring the fruit to his mouth and swallow it. Then he wouldn't stir again until another fig fell. This is just the professor my son Neve, decided the rich man. He came out from his hiding place, introduced himself and asked if the professor would teach his son the science of laziness. Old man answered the old man answered the professor just above a whisper. If you want your son if you want to bring your son up, don't talk to me so much. Don't talk so much. It tires me to listen to you. If you want to bring up your son as you and I are, just send him to me.
the rich man went. So the rich man went home, took his son by the hand, thrust a feather pillow under his arm, and led him to the garden. I urge you, he told him, to do everything you see this professor of idleness do. already had an inclination for that particular science, also stretched underneath, also stretched out under the fig tree. Observing his teacher, he saw him reach for every fig that fell <coughs> and bring the fruit to his mouth. Why should I work myself to death reaching for figs, he thought. And he lay there with his mouth wide open. Soon a fig fell, and he let it go down slowly. Then he reopened his mouth. Another fig fell. <coughs> this time it missed. He lay there perfectly still and murmured, Why so wide at the mark? Fig fall into my mouth. Seeing how wise, seeing how wise, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> seeing how wise his pupil was already, the professor said, "Go on now. You have nothing to learn from me. You can even teach me something." So the boy went home to his father, who thanked heaven for having sent, who thanked heaven, who thanked heaven for having given him such a smart son. I'm sort of botched. Still working on that one. Oh. I have a tickle in my throat this morning. Dry, dry patch. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them to another, and assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal stations to which the laws of nature and nature of God entitle them, a decent respect of the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the, the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, and whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it, and institute new government, laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to themselves seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. See, prudence indeed will dictate governments long established should not be changed for light or transient causes. And whenever any form of government uh, an experience accordingly has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer when evils are sufferable than right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they have become accustomed. 
but one long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces the design to reduce them under absolute despotism. It is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government <clears throat> to throw off such government and provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having a direct object, all having a direct object the establishment of absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has refused to send to law as the most wholesome and necessary for the public good.
I've, got, I've baked four batches so far this morning, and I have three in the oven and one in the pot. Doing pretty good. The bagels look good. They look good. Fresh poppy seed.
doing pretty good. I'm baking about six batches an hour. That's what I need to be doing right now. This is a baker traveling at the speed of six batches an hour. As fast as we go. 